Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another Versus video. Today, we'll be looking at what would happen if the Systems Alliance tried to take down a Death Star, specifically the second Death Star and its Endor defenses. And for those who don't know, the Systems Alliance is basically the human faction in the Mass Effect universe. So we'll be taking into account the various technological and tactical advantages of each side, then we'll decide, of course, who would win. Before that though, let's look at some basic ground rules. First, we'll assume that all of the major events leading up to the Battle of Endor are basically the same, except we'll be subbing in the Rebel Alliance for the Systems Alliance. This means notably that they have knowledge of the Death Star's weakness and the presence of the Endor Shield Generator. We'll be taking the Alliance fleet as it appears in Mass Effect 3, along with a retrofitted Normandy SR2. For the sake of this video, and to make it more of a fair fight, we'll assume that Shepard prioritized human ships over the Destiny Ascension in Mass Effect 1. With that out of the way, let's examine the combatants. First, we have the Imperial forces present at the Battle of Endor. However, we will not be including either Palpatine or Darth Vader. We could say this is for fairness, but it's also because the two likely would not have been present had Luke Skywalker and the Rebel fleet not been there. They would have been somewhere safer. We will also be ignoring Grand Admiral Declan's battle meditation from the Legends expanded universe because the effect is pretty unclear. That being said, although Vader's not there, of course we'll keep the Executor and the rest of Death Squadron because it was integral to the Death Star's defense. I will also be ignoring the Ewoks, as this experiment is mostly to test the military and naval capabilities of the two factions. Other than that, things are the exact same. So, the second Death Star was massive, about 200 kilometers in diameter. This was a full 40 kilometers larger than the first Death Star. It also had a more efficient laser, which was able to fire precisely and quickly enough to take on the Rebel Alliance's capital ships. However, most importantly, especially for this scenario, it also had a planetary shield, which made any sort of direct assault impossible. The Death Star 2 was protected by a sizable Imperial fleet, known as Death Squadron, including 30 plus ISDs, countless TIE Fighter squadrons, at least two battle cruisers, several Tector Star Destroyers, and of course, the Executor SSD. The Executor is obviously the star of the show, possessing over 5,000 turbo laser cannons, ion batteries, and concussion missile launchers. Like the majority of Star Wars warships, it had shields which protected against physical and energy based attacks. The Empire's base on the moon of Endor protecting their shield generator was arguably the weakest portion of their defenses. It had only a small garrison of ATSTs and a battalion of scout and stormtroopers. ATSTs were maneuverable and well suited to combating the guerrilla warfare used by rebels and Ewoks, and came equipped with dual chin mounted blaster cannons, light cannons on the side, and sometimes concussion grenade or missile launchers. Moving over to the Systems Alliance, the faction possessed one of the largest fleets in the Mass Effect universe. There were regulations limiting the amount of dreadnoughts a given race was allowed to have built at any given time. The Turians were given the most because their forces were closely associated with the protection of the Citadel itself. Humans, however, only had about nine dreadnoughts by the time of Mass Effect 3, and they were comparatively much smaller than the dreadnoughts of Star Wars, only about a kilometer long, so even shorter than a standard Star Destroyer. Alliance fleets were subdivided into flotillas, which had four to six frigates to one cruiser. This helps to proportion out fleet composition. As a whole though, it's said by the time of the first contact war that humanity had about 200 vessels. Exact numbers during the Reaper War aren't known. We know they did continue to militarize, but there was only about a 30 year gap, so I'd say 1.5 times that many ships or so would be fair. We know that they did start using additional fleets, but it's very possible and I think likely that they didn't actually get more ships, but rather subdivided existing fleets to better cover territory. If you disagree and think I'm underplaying the amount of ships the Systems Alliance had available to them, let me know. Additionally, the Alliance made use of Trident personal fighters, which were quite small, but very maneuverable and equipped with disruptor torpedoes capable of disabling enemy kinetic shields. Offensively, Alliance ships were built primarily around Mass Effect technology, which allowed them to accelerate projectiles to incredibly deadly 
increased speeds. Both their ships and combat personnel also made use of Mass Effect fields in the form of kinetic barriers, which were capable of slowing down and stopping incoming projectiles, but were unable to protect against things like toxins or extreme heat. The Alliance here will also have access to a variety of ground and air vehicles, including the UT-47 Kodiak shuttle, which was primarily a dropship, and the A-61 Mantis gunship, which could provide air support. I won't be including the Mako or the Grizzly, as I don't think those would be useful in the dense trees of Endor. Kodiak specifically were fast, but had poor handling, however with the right pilot, they could swiftly get troops on the battlefield. They normally carry 12 soldiers, but there was room for more in dire situations. Additionally, it was armed with a hangar bay turret. Mantis gunships, on the other hand, were fast and highly maneuverable, capable of switching between fast pursuit and hovering support. Mantises featured an array of mass accelerator machine guns and missile launchers, which were capable of taking out entire ground squadrons at a time. I will also be including a souped-out Normandy SR-2 in this fight, along with Shepard's crew. Offensively, the Normandy featured Javelin Disruptor torpedoes and the Thanix Cannon. The Thanix Cannon is certainly their strong tool, and, based on the design of Sovereign, fires molten metal at extraordinarily high speeds, devastating most targets. Additionally, the Normandy had kinetic shields and Guardian defense lasers, designed to destroy enemy projectiles before impact, if the enemy could even spot them of course on top of their top of the line stealth system, which didn't mask the ship visually but made it almost impossible to spot on radar. Notably, the Normandy had a specialized variant of the Kodiak on board, which was fitted with matching stealth systems, allowing for quick and unnoticed drops as long as nobody looks up. And this is a basic breakdown of the forces at play here. Now, it's time to see what they would do in a full-on battle. I believe that the Alliance would send the Normandy's crew in alone, using its stealth systems to get near the planet. Now, this is of course assuming that Star Wars technology is unable to detect the Normandy on sensors. This is sort of an interesting point, because although Star Wars is very advanced in some areas, others, like specialized computing, but not robotics, are less advanced. To keep the matchup fun, which we all know is the most important thing, I'll assume that 1. The Normandy is able to somehow avoid Imperial sensors, and 2. Can find some way through the planetary shield, whether that's piggybacking off another ship or something else. Regardless, I trust Shepard to be able to at least find a way in. This small attack force has no chance going in guns blazing, so Shepard will, as he normally does, stick with two companions. We'll need someone capable of hacking the Imperial Terminal to shut down the shields, and someone else to focus on combat. I think for hacking, the best choices would be Tally, Legion, or Edie. However, Edie is probably best left with the ship, so I'll take Tally because she's a good close range fighter. For combat, again, we want to stick with stealth, and that comes down to the lovable Garrus and his affinity for snipers, or Thane and his background as an assassin. I think because we want to go with total secrecy, even more so than the Alliance did, our best choice here would be Thane. So before the Alliance ground team actually engaged any of the troopers on the planet, the rest of the Alliance fleet would make the jump to the system, however landing a great deal away from the Imperial fleet. The Alliance's biggest advantage is range. Mass Effect makes it clear that range isn't an issue in space battles since an object will continue moving until it hits something. However, both Star Wars canon and Legends have limited the range of turbo lasers and if you don't like The Last Jedi, then you can look to the X-Wing novels. However, I don't think that will end up being decisive in this battle, so I won't outright ignore it like I might sometimes or go too deep into it. So we have the Executor and the other Star Destroyers being suddenly pelted by a barrage of mass accelerated projectiles. However, I use the word pelted with meaning. Power generation and weapon power in the Mass Effect universe is much, much lower than that of Star Wars. So I think the deflector shields should prevent any of the ships from being destroyed outright with the beginning barrage. With the Empire now alerted to the Alliance's presence, they begin to move the bulk of their fleet into firing range, sending ties out to meet the Trident fighters. The slow speed of the Imperial ships 
the capital ships that is, would give the Alliance some time to continue their barrage, but as we'll see in a second, it's really only at the point where they outrange the Imperial ships that they have any sort of advantage, because they are very, very heavily outgunned. The Empire primarily uses energy-based turbo lasers, which would completely bypass the Alliance's kinetic shields, taking out several ships almost immediately. In response, the Alliance's main strategy would be to outmaneuver the larger Imperial capital ships, also splitting their fleet up so at least some of their ships could maintain distance. Still, in my opinion, it's inevitable that even with an advantage of 2, 3, maybe even 400 to 30, the Alliance will eventually be destroyed in a straight out slugging match. With the Imperial fleet pulled away from the Death Star, the ground team inserts itself into the shield generator and returns to the Normandy. I do think the leadership skills of Commander Shepard and the ability of his companions will allow him to do this without being noticed. If they can return to the Normandy, and of course this is a big if, the ship, still stealth from its initial insurgents, would make its way out of the planet into the Death Star's exposed reactor. Now, of course, the port is much too small for the Normandy itself, as it only would barely fit the Millennium Falcon. This is where the second cargo port of the Normandy comes into play. Of course, this is assuming that the Systems Alliance has came up with a really great plan, but by the time the Normandy emerges from Endor, the Empire should be too far to immediately respond to the Normandy's attack. So, the Normandy launches a single Trident fighter, piloted by Steven Cortez, into the Death Star's reactor chamber. Cortez was a skilled pilot, even when flying the clumsy Kodiak, and had extensive experience flying Trident fighters before his redeployment to the Normandy. This makes him the best man for the job. Of course, it's very, very likely that the Death Star would still have garrison ties, or ties back defensively, so the Normandy would have to try to destroy as many as possible with its Guardian lasers. However, it's not going to get all of them. To be frank, Cortez ain't making it out of this one, and he will most likely be forced to sacrifice himself crashing his trident into the reactor. Assuming this does enough damage, the Death Star will begin to self-destruct. The Imperial fleet, hopefully in disarray because they hadn't let any ship by but the station is still being destroyed, would attempt to regain its composure. The Normandy would join the battle, but still, the Alliance fleet is no match in a head-to-head -head contest against the Empire. That being said, if everything went 100% correctly, I do think they could still destroy the Death Star. The Alliance has no chance in head-to-head -head combat against the Empire. They have no chance of gaining the total victory that the Rebel Alliance did, because Vader and Palpatine aren't there. It's a Pyrrhic victory, because their fighting force was essentially used as a distraction and will have been pulverized. So just to summarize it all, could the Alliance destroy the Death Star? Well, if everything went perfectly. And I give their chance of doing so maybe a 5.5 times out of 10. Maybe the ground team is discovered and the whole plan falls apart. Maybe they can't find a way through the deflector shield. Maybe there are too many ties near the Death Star for them to make their way to the core. Regardless, if anyone can win this battle, I do think it is Shepard. But to be honest, I'd much, much rather do it how Luke and the gang did. That however is just my opinion. What do you think of this matchup? Did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? Do you like the sort of fun way that I approach this one? Let me know all of that and more down in the description. Anyway, as always guys, this has been your host Eckhart's Ladder. Have a great week and may the force be with you.